Good afternoon. This is the Thursday, January 2nd, 2020 meeting of the Athens City Planning Commission. Uh, all members but one are present. Um, the quorum has been established. Uh, people who are expecting to speak before the Planning Commission today, if you would raise your right hand and do you solemnly swear to tell the truth as you know it. Thank you very much. Uh, disposition of the December 19, 2019 meeting minutes. Are there any uh, changes, observations? If not, I'll make a motion to uh, accept. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Uh, one absentee. Cases for today, case number 20-01, Title 41, new EMS facility at 31 Kenny Drive. Good morning, Mr. Riggs. Good afternoon, Mr. Riggs. Do you care to update us on that? Yeah, good morning, Councilman, uh, Council Chair. This is the... Uh, Title EMS facility 41. They, um, last year, I believe, they came to Planning Commission with a, with an introduction. Um, they submitted several sets of plans. Staff has reviewed those, and we have a list of those uh, on the memo that I sent to you. Um, I don't know if you needed me to go over those or not. The biggest one is we, we know that there's some issues with the storm drainage leaving the site. Um, and uh, staff and, uh, and the applicant are working to address those issues. Um, first of all, just a small point. I'm seeing three different addresses, uh, 31 yep. Kenny Drive, yeah. 26, 20, dr and 21. That, I have a typo there. I think it is 21 Kenny Drive. It's 21? Yes. Okay. Were there any questions uh, from the board? Yeah, Member Stump? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could just make an update just to highlight that one particular item that uh, uh, Mr. Riggs noted. Um, there is an ongoing storm issue over there, and ultimately it has to do with a major storm sewer that was installed uh, back when the area was uh, initially developed in the 80s. Um, and uh, that um, that storm line that crosses the property and is the receiving storm line for the facility uh, subsequently outlets uh, in the vicinity of the railroad tracks that go through there and then subsequently cross the railroad tracks, goes uh, to the land behind Morrison Elementary School on down to Mar Margaret's Creek. Uh, due to siltation over the years, uh, that space has increased, or the, the, the um, the elevation of the some of the surrounding terrain has increased above uh, the the flow line of the uh, the invert of the uh, the outlet on that storm sewer. So we've been working with the uh, the administration has been working with the uh, the architects and engineers and contractors on on how at least they can get their line built and connected um, to ultimately make that. 48 inch storm sewer drain uh, is going to take some future work that will involve some uh, Corps of Engineers permitting uh, in the area where Morrison Elementary School is or behind. Um, we believe there's an opportunity and for the members uh, of the county and the, and the design and uh, team that are here um, in, the, in the coming months as uh, the plans for the new Morrison Elementary School get, uh, get built or get, get, get brought to fruition, uh, they're gonna have to be doing work back there anyway. And so I think they, that uh, the work that they have to do is gonna require uh, a 404 permit and subsequently uh, uh, solving the problem associated with drainage of that, of that 48 inch sewer uh, can get solved with construction of the new Morrison Elementary School. So hopefully, I just wanted to get that in the, in the minutes that that's our, that's our approach right now. Okay. Um, the other question I had earlier when this came forward was just in terms of uh, safety as far as Route 56 and the ingress, egress. Uh, is something like that going to be addressed or do you feel confident that people will be able to be safe enough as far as an ambulance coming out? Sure. The, um, I have to go back and look at the speed limits. Um, the speed limit is 45. 45 there. It's, yeah. thir it's 40, I thought, well, right? Yeah, it's 40, 40 there. It's 35 at the existing driveway. 
uh, for the existing EMS station. I don't know if you guys put any thought of that at all, uh, or if we'd want to have yeah, members speak to that. Yeah, I, come up to yes, just come to the podium, please, and just uh, could you uh, give us your name and the firm you represent, please? My name's Clinton Kinsley. I'm with Buckley Group, and we were the civil engineers on this project. In regards to the entrance, uh, I know at the introductory meeting we had talked about maybe using a similar signage, um, do not block driveway, um, for when there's uh, traffic, uh, school traffic that might back up that far. Um, as far as speed limits, I don't foresee a, an issue in terms of um, getting out of Kenny Drive. I think we've got good sight distance from that entrance to um, to the west and also to the east. So, um, if there's any other questions about that, we can we can address those. But I think the signage, if we just use that same verbiage and, and signage from the existing EMS uh, location and I would think that would address uh, being able to pull out during odd hours or heavy traffic hours. Because if you're going away from Athens you're going up a rise yep. over that and so I just wanted to make sure that you felt that was going to be safe. Up, up like turning left out of Kenny Drive I, I believe so, yeah. I don't think there's um, there's a, a visual impairment to to traffic pulling out, but... Um, well, the, the that, uh, railway overpass is going to be widened in 2021, 2022, well, some point in the future. So I think that might uh, enhance that area as well, because that's going to be widened by... This, substantial widening of the bridge. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, does anyone else from the audience care to speak on uh, this particular case? Did someone want to make a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move that uh, uh, the uh, Planning Commission approve um, the EMS station in accordance with the uh, conditions set forth in the memorandum uh, that Mr. Riggs has provided. All of these comments have already been provided to the uh, to the designers and contractors and, and uh, they've indicated that they can comply with these. And a second. second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 So that's unanimous with one absentee. Uh, next would be uh, case number 20 Zero dash zero two Title Forty One Ohio University Credit Union Building Edition at nine forty four East State Street. Introduce yourself and the firm you represent, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, this is our second time on the introductory uh, meeting back on the 5th of December. Uh, this is uh, Josh Most here present at Wesley Construction, representing Ohio University Credit Union for a proposed construction of a two-story addition, uh, 944 East State Street. I have with me a design team, uh, Jim Rudy from J. Rudy Architects, along with Ken White from DLZ Engineering, perform the civil construction documents. Um, do you, I would ask the council, Mayor and David Riggs, do, would you like me to continue from the previous meeting on the 5th um, or would you like to have a recap from that prior meeting where we, uh, we showed the 3D video as well as walked through the renderings? Um, I think just a brief uh, 
reminder to people if you just catch up on the boards. I don't okay. know that a video is necessary. Okay. Um, so what we have uh, planned is a two-story addition that is going to be on the northeast corner of the existing two-story building at 944 East State Street. Um, it'll be 7,085 square feet with total with uh, 30, roughly 3,500 square feet per floor. It will house um, their, their operations group um, as well as the executive team and collaboration area on the second floor. Uh, they are, um, the reason, and reason why they're pursuing the addition is that they're currently growing and out of space at both their 90 South Schaefer Street and their 12 West Union facility. So this will enable them to um, substantiate the growth that they've incurred, which is a good thing here in the community. Um, I also have present um, in the audience with me is the uh, CEO and Chief Executive Officer Corey Corrigan, as well as the Board President Chuck Colton. Um, roughly, we are adding another 22 parking spaces, and that would um, enable each staff member to have a parking space at the original 97, and then the growth of the additional staff that will be in the addition and allow for 22 parking spaces that are designated for membership parking in the front and side of the buildings. Um, and that is. Um, that's shown on the site plan. You have a copy of the site plan uh, in front of you on your desk. And um, that is the current civil site plans that have been submitted. Um, we've also addressed a number of the comments that were provided by uh, co-director Mr. Riggs from, from the police chief as well as the um, fire chief and EMS. And uh, we also will address, and we are, is addressed, is uh, Mr. Stone's comment at the last 12-5 meeting, which was for... Uh, Doing performing best practices for 5.07 of 0.09 of the requirement to prevent, control, and reduce stormwater pollutants by the use of best management practices. We've also included that, and I'll, I'll go over those three items um, with in detail here in just a moment. Um, so that you have a copy in front of you. We have compiled all of our documents, all the construction documents, including the structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and civil that you have in front of you and submitted to the state for a building permit on the 24th. Uh, that has now been assigned and is in currently in review with the potential of a two week turnaround. At that time, we will then um, compile and finish our zoning application and submit that into uh, co-director David Riggs for their zoning review. So I'd like to start now, I guess, about going through on the comments that were made and provided to us. Uh, the first one being the um, storm comment and storm management, water management comment. Um, on page, what is it, page C? Six. Page C6, if you'll take a look at that, specifically you, Mr. Stone, we've uh, in installed a rain garden, and I'll let Ken from DLZ give you the details on that, but basically it's we have a flat roof, and that roof has two points of water ejection. We picked up the roof drain there to grab water from the building before it goes down to the site and then to the river. Yep. So Ken, could you just give Mr. Stone and the yeah. council so a quick... The, the rain garden is <coughs> wedged there on the west side of the building. And essentially, it's going to have a, a two-foot bottom width with four to one side slopes. Um, there's a cross-sectional detail on uh, sheet C62. Um, the outlet will be a, a beehive grate, and there will be about six inches of storage uh, in the bottom of the swale. with uh, so some bio media uh, to filter the rainwater, and then a, a clean out at the upstream end to uh, to clean out the under drain when necessary. Uh, on the landscape plan, which is the last sheet of the set, there uh, we have perennials planted in the, the rain garden to help absorb some of the, the the runoff that comes into the rain garden. So there isn't, there really isn't um, anywhere the water is going to run off of the roof um, because we have parapet walls around the three sides. So the ejection will come on the west side near the existing drive-through canopy, and that's where we plan place that detention area. So I'm following this correctly. Uh, it says keyed notes, and it has it. I see right here. So is it is it item number two under key notes? Uh, 
Item number six, if you're on sheet C6, oh, okay, yep. item number six, key note number six points to the, the bioretention area, and then the, the details are on the sheet C6-2. And then the section is on C6-2. Yep, I saw the section on C6-2. I mean, that's, that's right in line with what I was at. Okay, I see it here. I see six now. It's that stretch right along there. Yeah, that's that's exactly what, what we were trying to get at uh, with that section of code. So thank you very much for taking that uh, okay, uh, taking that note to heart. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then um, I'll briefly read uh, Police Chief Captain Ralph Harvey's comments and then respond to it, which we've also ad addressed prior before going into building permit. Um, it basically didn't have any um, real commentary on the plans other than uh, he did not see a corresponding marking on the plans for light poles. So he had saw those on the renderings we provided, but on the last set we had existing and a couple of pole lights relocated. Um, we've set, um, due to his support of the additional north parking and new access, according to his commentary, um, the plan looks good from his perspective and noticed a second entrance proposal, which is the northwest corner um, from the access road, which is the McLaren Way on the west side of the plan. Uh, and he saw a lot of benefit for his patrol, pedestrian safety, and access, and would su suggest support that we uh, that it be installed as well as the additional parking that is also proposed. Um, so we have actually, from since that time frame, we have in his original plans we have added. Uh, you have the correct plan. I think it's the other cycle. Is that the landscape plan? Okay. Um, on the uh, C5, and you also see that on your um, site improvement plan, but on your sheets you'll see that we've added three additional parking lights, two to the north and then one on the west to cover the addition as well as the new parking area. And then we've also maintained all of the existing site lighting, so we haven't subtracted anything. We've actually replaced, relocated, and added three additional pole lights. And then with our zoning submission, we will, we will provide the light output plan, photometrics, um, to show the appropriate coverage. And then, um, as I said, uh, Captain Ralph Harvey was in support of the additional parking at the north as well as the north entrance. Um, tying back to that, I uh, will just state that we have an easement agreement adopted um, and drafted. We will have it signed here by the end of the week with uh, James and Bonnie McLaren as well as the credit union. And this would be for, uh, I've highlighted on the on the, this plan, but we will be widening the 15 foot existing McLaren drive, which is in front of or to the east of the existing trailers that are on the west side of the building in order for us to to um, create the new northwest corner entrance into the parking lot. So we'll be widening this. Um, there's an existing easement in place for uh, access for the credit union to go into the existing west uh, southwest entrance exit. And so they've agreed to allow us, the credit union, to widen the McLaren Avenue. So I, I have that um, agreement in place. They'll be signing that and executing it, and I'll provide copy of that to Mr. Riggs upon completion. Um, let's see. Uh, Fire Chief uh, Robert Reimer also responded with comments, um, basically stated that he had no comments and that we would uh, provide copies of our permit plans uh, once they're approved by the state, which we will do. Were you going to install a fire alarm sprinkler system or? Yeah, so, so the, part of the existing building does not have a fire alarm or fire suppression plan. Um, we are zoned in construction 5B, which is not a requirement to have a fire suppression or fire alarm uh, system in place. So we're matching the existing construction and we're not installing an additional fire alarm for the separate separation of the building. Um, the building is technically a separate structure um, adjoining the existing building with two openings. So it's a complete and independent structure. Is there anything you'd like to add on that, Jim? Um, just that uh, the code allows for you to increase um, allowable square footage of the building, the existing building plus the addition is well below the allowable increase from accessibility around the building. So um, sprinkler and fire alarm was not needed to 
allow for an increase to the uh, square footage. Is there a gap in between the, you said there's two separate buildings? They abut, the yeah, they abut in the fire rated assembly, but there, there is no, there is technically, I guess there's, there's technically a two inch, a two inch joint, okay. um, expansion, expansion joint. joint between the, two. Okay. the foundations marry and abut, and then the perimeter of the building around the envelope. Okay. Any other questions? The, uh, your, to your point about lighting, um, you know, there is a provision in the zoning code that talks about dark skies and, and light pollution and it just requires the cutoff type lights and I think the other existing site lighting is that way already. I'm assuming even though, and there's no reason to resubmit, but I'm assuming your, your, your fixtures are such that they would be uh, that kind of fixture. They are. As yeah. I'm, yeah, the only difference in the fixture is the um, update to the LED. Perfect. That is all. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mayor? So I think I brought this up the last time. It was a question about accessible parking. Um, that that's all in the front of the building um, as it exists now. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and how many is that? I'm I'm counting five or six on here. There's existing. There's four ADA spaces, and then with the addition of the new parking, we'll have to bump that up to five. So you're adding one more. Yeah, adding and one more. And why is it just in the front as opposed to any around the side? Um, so the, the grade on the sides of the building, because it's upland towards the north of the property, and it's easier from a constructability standpoint to build them without having to tear up additional parking lot. Um, so they're all just clustered with the existing spaces. So employees with, with uh, accessibility issues are all going to have to park in the front and then operations of the bank are also providing for ADA parking for customers. Yeah. So will they be competing with each other over spaces? Not based on the quantity that's required based on the square footage um, per code. Yeah. But what, what they're currently doing is no different than what we are proposing. So the only handicapped spaces, accessible spaces, are in the front. So the, the, any existing staff that would require the use of those are there as well. So they're currently doing the exact same thing that they're doing in the new addition versus the existing. And another thing is that the, that there's an existing elevator and an existing building is located in the front, I'm sorry, in the front half of the building. So if they needed to get access to the second floor, that's more convenient for them. Mr. Chair, and I have one other item, and, and this is not so much a question, just as a, as a statement and for the leadership of the, the um, uh, credit union who's here. Uh, I've met uh, previously on the existing uh, kind of headquarters of the, of the, or the, the, the Schaefer Street, not headquarters, I guess, of where the administrative offices are, the Schaefer Street location, and, and um, you know, we are willing to, to help uh, the credit union uh, if you do any redevelopment in that area. Um, because we see that as an important part of the city. We've got the Union Street project that is going to take place here in, in future years, and so we still stay keenly interested in, in whatever you plan on doing down there and, and uh, are certainly willing to help um, and, and bring that to fruition if you do have redevelopment plans uh, on down the road. And that would be redevelopment for the 90 South Schaefer Street, Correct. Schaefer Street Correct. area? Anything else? Um, should I just go ahead and bring that up? Um, would you care that if I recuse myself um, because my wife is uh, an officer at uh, a competitor and if you would like me to stay out of the voting, that's fine. And if not? I'm okay either way. Okay. Um, would someone care to make a motion? I agree. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 See unanimous with one absentee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's uh, see. We've all been waiting for. Um, case number 19-07, uh, City Council Resolution R-08-19, a request to consider amending zoning code to include short-term rentals in residential areas, in residential zones, I'm sorry. Um, we have received a couple different takes on things as well as uh, uh, let's see, a proposal from 
should I just say as the city? Yeah, the administration. The administration. Um, Ms. Hodson uh, has submitted something for us, and uh, Member Bain has also submitted something. Member and, Bain. And I was, um, I was submitting it because uh, Andy said he was through. And so I thought, no, it can't stop here. We've got to go on. And so that's why I sent it. And it's very simple. And I think it might be incorporated. Maybe it isn't. Is it incorporated? We did. We pulled in your ideas as we as we uh, attempted I was just to uh, trying to solve the problem. Sure. As we attempted to, to go forward. Mm -hmm. okay. Where does it say the streets? It says on the Okay, so let's see. Member Stone, do you care just to go through what changes then that we made, or shall I just read through uh, the changes that were? I can, I can, I can speak to it if okay. that's if that would be helpful. So um, uh, at our last meeting, um, we we talked about um, the administration's proposal of uh, basically shortening the amount of uh, time that somebody was uh, renting their home from six months to any time that someone was renting their home, they would be required to get a, uh, a rental permit. And just modifying under the R1 uh, provision in, in uh, Title 23 um, that, um, <clears throat> that a, a rental permit would be required for any duration. And um, um, in that instance, with our previous uh, iteration of this, um, a existing or a, a, a home, so long as they were following the rental uh, regulations with either two resident owners or three uh, non-resident, non-related folks could uh, rent a home uh, in, in, uh, in the R1, um, it could end up being a... Um, you could have a short-term rental and to disregard into the regulatory structure that we had put forward in an R1, um, following those current rental requirements. What we heard basically in our last meeting was that, you know, even that was too objectionable um, for some of the concerns. And so we went back uh, and we further uh, restricted it. And that's what you have in front of you. Um, so what we propose changing is in, right now in uh, section five under um, the, uh, the permitted uses in the R1, it has rentals. We would change it and we would add a section six and then renumber the rest of the, the items in there. And so section five would be changed to long-term rentals and section six would be short-term rentals. The um, section five long-term rentals um, is basically any time uh, the, the existing uh, conditions, basically uh, two resident um, renters, two renters by resident owner or three unrelated uh, non-resident uh, renters for periods of greater than 30 days uh, would be classified as long-term renters um, and you'd have to get a permit. Short-term rentals uh, would be added <clears throat> as a permitted use and it would be keeping of not more than two renters by a resident owner for periods of less than 30 days. So basically what this would allow for uh, is somebody if they, uh, this is, you know, we can't use the phrase homestay because that's a, um, that's a uh, um, copyrighted phrase, but the concept would be if you had a spare room uh, and you were a resident owner, um, you could, just like right now, you can rent to uh, two, um, two, own, two, two renters as a resident owner, as a, as a normal rental, you would be able to do so for a short-term rental. You would not, be able to do to uh, non-resident um, renters in a short-term capacity. So that's basically that change there. The further on down, the other change we made um, is under the conditionally permitted uses. Uh, and it talks about uh, short-term rentals for non-resident short-term rentals in compliance with the, um, the, the current rental requirements, which is no more than three adult renter, renters plus related children uh, for periods of less than 30 days being allowed as a conditional use approved by the BZA in lots that abut uh, an R2 or R3 or B and or that front on East State Street, Carpenter Street, Lancaster Street, and Columbus Road. So basically those, those arterials. Um, so the, the, these would not be allowed even conditionally 
like in the hearts of the R1 neighborhoods under this proposal. Um, all the other changes are the ones that we had made previously or we had recommended previously and those are reflected in your, in your document in blue. Um, and, and we would uh, contend that the, uh, uh, we would recommend uh, going back to city council that they also take up um, the changes we proposed in titles 15 and 29, which are the income tax and the, um, and the I'm sorry, not income tax, transit guest tax and the housing, uh, the housing code to require um, rental permits for periods. Uh, any, anytime you're renting anything, you gotta get a rental permit and using our existing regulatory structure. So that's what we proposed. Uh, it's a more restrictive model than what we had proposed the last time. And I don't know, did I cover all that? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Uh, Member Bain. Could you review for those of us that don't read the code daily what a conditional use permit would require? It requires ingress and egress parking. So all of the all of the ball controls would apply mm -hmm. yes. just like they would anywhere else um, uh, to a con if someone got a conditional use. And um, so they would, those are not, they're not variable, are they? Right. They That's can't right. be varied? Um, or they can be varied. You, you, could, you, you could request a variance for uh, parking or for uh, any of the section uh, Title 29 uh, housing. Okay. But uh, that would, it, it would be a request. You don't, they don't get automatically approved. Almost always do, though. <laughs> Every zoning board almost always does. Well, actually, there are two different. Uh, I don't want to get too complicated for you, but there are actually two different ways the zoning would, would uh, or the uh, the conditional use would be approved. One would be through the zoning. So for parking, you'd have a zoning uh, mm -hmm. approval part of the BZA. Um, but if it had to do with the with the structure itself, the house, the rental p property itself, that would go through a different. Uh, 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 housing board uh, would have to approve that. Okay, well, I will just say that my house on Columbia Avenue, 111 abuts Columbus Road, so I, I thought it was kind of funny. I mean, I'm not intending to do anything like that, but... Is it front on Columbus Road? It abuts. Right, it says fronts. That, that's the word that I... I wonder if you couldn't, if we couldn't see a map, um, you know, that would have where this would be allowed, an overlay. It's an overlay kind of thing, right? I mean, it, it says, just right. to be clear though, it says fronts, not abuts. Well, so see. it means that your, your, your frontage is on, mm -hmm. of, your, of that address. I, you know, I don't streets. really care, but it said, I thought it said both sides of the street. Yeah, he says yes, you say so, no. well, it's on, so on uh, yeah. East State Street, it'd be on the north side or on the south side. Yeah, and so that would go all the way up to Franklin, right? I mean, it's it's just words now, but I'm trying to think about what it's like in space. I may I think be what wrong. we were I think what we were trying to do is if your if your property is on one of these yeah. major major roads, mm -hmm. then then you would be you would have to be conditionally permitted to uh, have a short term rental there. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the fronting is important. Um, so it, uh, if there's a through lot that were to go all the way to Franklin from East State Street, for instance. Most of them do. Um, a goodly number do. The, the house that is, if, if, if the house is, if the front of the house is on Franklin, then it would not. Okay. Would not. If the front of the house is on East State Street. Correct. Could we add that clarification then? Well, I, I, I mean, we could. I think it's an interpretation. I mean, could we have a map sometime of these? I mean, have... Have you walked down the streets and looked at what it's going to be? I'm just a little bit worried about some areas. There's not much parking in some places. I can see a few being really good bed and breakfast or whatever the VRBOs, but I don't know. I don't want to give you trouble because I'm happy that we're making progress, but... Do you think, um, I mean, do you have other language that you... That oh, we don't could, start. ...that could write <laughs> in, in? I mean, we could certainly write it in while we're here if there's a... Oh, I can't do it on a dime. Let's see. So, so, Nancy, is it a question about the principal residence? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I agree with Andy. I think there's language that we could probably hash out right now mm -hmm. to clarify that so that if... If you're concerned about unintended consequences, that we try to mm -hmm. minimize and that I'm immediately. I'm concerned about all the people um, who see it that way. Um, but I think if perhaps it's um, uh, on any, or that were the principal address or the principal home 
uh, fronts on East State Street, Carpenter, okay, Lancaster, or Columbus Road, something like that. Who was that? I mean, that, that was the intent of the language, so I, it's well, important I mean, that we clarify it. that I still think yeah. we need an um, overlay map, maybe. You can make one. I mean, you know, I, mean, I don't know that you need to a now, but I think that as we start. I would agree. I mean, just as a, as, as, as yeah. a uh, you know, ability to conduct enforcement, mm -hmm. um, I think that that would be a useful tool. It's useful certain. also. This is Mr. Stauffer's idea mm -hmm. used again. But um, I'm concerned about the size of the lots and parking. I don't know. Some of these may not work out. Well, anyway. Well, I mean, the bulk controls apply in yeah. all cases. And so unless they're varied. Correct, unless they're varied. But for, say, for instance, um, number six here in the beginning, you know, that's not a, a variant situation. You would have to, I mean, I guess you could go and, and, and seek a variance, but, um, you know, we don't, um, you know, for someone who, who wants to have a resident um, renter, basically mm -hmm. rent out a spare room, they got to have a parking space for them under mm -hmm. our code. I mean, they can't just do that without a parking space currently. And, and the same thing would apply in this situation. Okay, as long as it's clear, absolutely. Because so, the people who live in these neighborhoods are probably want input. I mean, in the, the fringes of these neighborhoods. When we thought, you know, particularly that, that um, by being a conditionally permitted use and the fact that we have to give notice uh, when properties go before the BZA, um, that that would be an opportunity uh, at the time should somebody seek a variance under that uh, for these little fringes fringe areas that are included um, they have the ability to go to the BZA and that, and that happens I mean people neighbors go to the BZA a lot uh, when when they've got concerns about things in the BZA in in my experience and I don't know you guys can probably speak to a little bit more than I can um, take those take those responses into consideration and but, they generally say yes I mean they say yes nationally not only here the zoning board is usually positive in its response. I mean, I've read the research on it. It's but the predominance of homes in the R1 would be protected yeah. from this, with mm -hmm. this, with the exception of the main streets, or the uh, streets that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and the abutments. Okay. The principal home, I, I'm going to add that language. So, mm -hmm. um, if you look at the language, and, and we'll provide a copy of this to uh, um, to the secretary. So after that um, sentence under uh, C, um, I guess it would be C2 or C3, um, the, uh, after the, the term R1 lot that abut on an R2, R3, or any B zone, or that the principal home fronts on, does that make sense? We'd mm -hmm. add those, those words. Okay. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe. I'm so let me. I just want to understand one thing, though. As far as uh, on the abutment on a, a against an R two three or B zone. So if you're across the street, it's not abutting, is it? And that's not abutting, right? As far as abutting would be right behind. I just want to understand this. The property properties have to touch each other. Right. Right. So if there's a if there's a public right of way. So the house that, that's on the corner of uh, Sunnyside and or Maplewood and East State, if it had a house behind it, that would be allowable also or Well just no, that? because that's an R one, that whole thing right. is an R one. So this is abutting those other zones, not okay. abutting the houses, abutting the streets. Does that make Correct. sense? It's right. only the house mm -hmm. fronting on the street. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it wouldn't abut necessarily the, the streets that have been mentioned if it's in R1. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Um, do you want to pass out the chair? Sure. So <clears throat> we talked about enforcement. That's the other thing I wanted to kind of bring to commissions and, and the challenges of enforcing, particularly under the licensing provisions and how, um, you know, we, we have some deep concerns about trying to do licenses as a mechanism for enforcement versus permits under the rental permit thing. And uh, uh, Mr. Riggs um, has signed up the city with a, a monitoring service. Um, and this gives you an indication, if you want to speak to this, what we're, what we're seeing here. This is kind of our first cut, and then it gets refined over time as they, as they zero in on it. 
Um, so there's a company called Host Compliance that uh, uh, we've uh, got a contract with for a year to look at um, which um, units, which houses are, are doing short-term rentals. Um, and so what they do is they look at over 50 um, internet websites to see where they're advertising because that's the vast majority of the uh, of these these sites use the internet to advertise and we found we've pinpointed some uh, sites in the city of Athens and I think there's uh, 31 total uh, sites that we have and these are units um, not not necessary addresses um, so it could be like a like a like an apartment A. Our apartment B, yeah. So apartment A is being is being lived in. Apartment B is being rented out as a short term. Yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, no. Uh, yeah. So we we think there's a total of 15 uh, addresses in that are currently in an R1 zone that are uh, using doing short term rentals at this time. Um, we're we're trying to to. Um, uh, be more accurate with uh, data. This is the first week that I've seen it, and we don't really have a good um, uh, shape file for the uh, the company doesn't have a good shape file for the city's corp limits. So I was looking and trying to guess which ones were inside the corp limits. I think you can do that fairly accurately here. Mm -hmm. um, we will be providing uh, Paul will be providing a shape file to the company um, so that we'll know exactly how many units will be located inside uh, mm. corp limits. I also had a couple questions about whether the, some of these were duplicates, and I'll do some more research on that, trying to figure it out. This is my first stab at seeing it for the for the first uh, couple of days of, of this uh, of this program. So there there are some units out there that are being uh, that are being listed as short term rentals, and this is just for this. What you see there is just for the one week. So there could be they could go away next week, and new ones pop up. We'll, we'll do more research on that as well. Can you explain how we get the notification of, of like how, what the arrangement is with the company? On how yeah, they they do a weekly report for us that will show uh, every week which um, which uh, addresses are being are, um, advertised on the on the internet, and we'll keep a track. We'll keep a track record of that to keep so we'll know exactly how uh, how many units are are being. Advertised, not that they're being used, but are being advertised uh, in the corporate limits. Uh, they have other features that we can look at in the future that can give us more information. Um, right now, with this number of units, um, I think that's something that the um, that the code office could manage. Um, we we already look at uh, 5,600 uh, rental units, and so adding a few more is not going to make a huge uh, impact on the amount of work that we have. It'll be more, but it won't be uh, won't be an enormous impact. We don't think. You know, I think the good news with this tool is that, you know, you've got your list of permitted structures, basically, and then this tool pops and you cross-reference it on a weekly basis because um, it's frequent, you know, with the way that people advertise and, and such. And, and if, if something pops that's not on that list, you know, that's a, that's a code officer at the door going, hey, you're not. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah what are you doing? You're not in, in compliance, number one. And then number two, uh, this data will be provided to the tax administrator um, so that, that the tax administrator can continue to collect or can collect the transit guest tax as, as appropriate um, for, uh, um, for um, you know, instances where these would be used. Again, what are the, uh, the uh, penalties uh, if someone doesn't uh, apply? They just go ahead and offer their home out? Uh, if they, if, let's say they, they kept doing it and they weren't, they weren't, uh, they weren't getting an application. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Plans? <laughs> um, they would be cited into court at that. We would issue a citation and cite them as a minor misdemeanor into court, and technically it could be $100 a day for every day they're doing it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's it, basically unpermitted rentals is what it would be. Correct. Yeah, which, is, which happens in Athens, and, and, and you know, we take people, and we take people to court, and they... You know, right. Ten, you know, because our system is, um, at least in my observation over the years, is, is mature as far as our rental permit system and has worked. You know, everyone kind of understands how how it works in the city, and so uh, there's not a lot of, um, um, you know, a lot of slack for somebody who's not following the rental permit system in Athens from the from the courts. Uh, as far as getting an unpermitted rental, uh, everybody understands that's how you how you do business in Athens to include the judges. So, that, in our experience, mm -hmm. makes sense. Does anyone, Member Bain, do you have anything else? Any follow up? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, yes. I did raise the question last time we met, and it was about uh, what is already permissible, which is short-term rentals and R3s, and I believe you did a little bit of research to see some of the larger apartment complexes, whether they do, in fact, or don't, with vacant rooms have short-term rentals. Yeah, Lance Allison and I went to uh, several of the larger uh, rental units um, and asked them, uh, went to the front office and asked if they did, short, if they had any desire or if they were doing short-term rentals for, mostly for parents who wanted to come in on certain weekends. And we did have a couple of those units that said, or a couple of those uh, um, uh, entities that said that they had a unit or two that they were using. And that actually shows up on the, on the uh, map that you have there. Um, several of them said it wasn't econo economically feasible for them because of the cost of, uh, of uh, uh, cleaning the rooms and having to prepare them with, you know, they have to have all the furnishings and stuff installed and they just wasn't going to be economically feasible for them and they weren't interested in doing that. So we did have a couple of, a couple of the bigger units that were doing one or two um, uh, short-term rentals. You know, one of the the biggest things we found doing our research, and I, I don't mean to belabor that particular point, but is um, the idea of something flipping back and forth between uh, like a normal longer term rental and a short term rental. Um, really, the the furniture is the is the barrier because yeah, decor and furniture. If you're going to have something that you um, are going to advertise and rent short term, similar to a hotel room. You got to have it furnished, and it's got to look nice, and people are going to stay there. Uh, if you've got a vacant house that you used to rent uh, to people for long term, and they all move their furniture out, you're not going to buy, you know, bedroom suits and 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 living room furniture and coffee makers, you know, coffee makers, and all yeah, those yeah. things in order to make it, you know, be able to be a short term rental, flip back and forth. That's just not um, something that people people will do. They'll use it for one or the other. But the ability or to have something flip back and forth is, is, is much, much less likely. That's kind of some of the feedback we got when we did our, our research. Um, let's see. Any other questions, comments? I do have a comment on here. So the, the document that we've got in front of us where there were the blue and red strike throughs um, under C. Where am I there? This is uh, R08-19. It has uh, one recreational, two utility stations, three has been struck through, but then it goes back to two again for short-term rentals. And again, this is unless this is in a clean dock, um, that would need to be yeah. changed to number three, and then sequentially after that, make sure that the rest of the numbering is in line. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. yes. Noted. And again, tourist home is is out of the R1. Correct. Correct. And it's brought it's it's uh, it's brought back in, I believe, as it was initially, but um, uh, bringing back that in as in an R3 zone. Again, in an R3. Yes. Yeah. And you can see that on page four of that document if you turn it over. <coughs> Since there's only a few people here, uh, unless somebody on the board has anything else to add at this time. The only other thought, and I don't know, Mayor, did you want to bring up that some of the research we did in, uh, that Paul did with um, that percentage? Uh, or do I we bring would. it up later? No, I mean, I think it's okay. important for people to know, at least uh, uh, for those who are here as well as anyone who's watching. Is um, I know you did some research on existing rental permits, correct? In R1 neighborhoods, um, and you did it. Did you do it by ward, or you did it? Uh, we did. We did it by generally agreed upon neighborhood boundaries. Neighborhood. Um, I don't have all the figures with me this morning or this afternoon, but what, what we looked at was, um, uh, you know, conventional wisdom in Athens is that 75% of the the housing units in Athens are rental. Um, only 25% of the housing units in Athens is um, owner-occupied. If, if we're looking at the city as a whole, that is correct, and that includes all the R3 zones. 
Uh, however, what we started doing was looking at the actual R1 neighborhoods. 40% uh, of the land use in Athens, if you look on that map there, 40% is, is single-family zoning. Uh, within each of those neighborhoods, um, what we looked at, uh, the Far East Side neighborhood had about 10, 10 or 11% of the parcels in the Far East Side. Uh, of the land? Of the land, of the parcels, okay. were, are, were, were, had rental permits on them. Uh, on the Near East Side, it was about 28%. On the West Side, it was about 30 or 33%. South side was very low, only about six percent, I believe, total, and then the um, on the near or the the near north side uh, that was at about twenty eight percent. So, kind of looking at it, and part of the re part of the part of what we wanted to learn was um, uh, most cities of, of of our size really don't have a lot of rental units, especially in the large style that we have in Athens because we are a rental community. We have a lot of transients in this city, people that live here for three to four years, five years, and then they're gone. Um, and so, of course, there is a lot of demand for rentals because they're not going to be long-term residents here. Um, a lot of cities of our size um, uh, have none of that type of housing because they don't have transients. It is all fixed, fixed property. Uh, and in, in a typical neighborhood or a typical city that doesn't have a um, uh, skewed percentage of the people who are transients, you'll see that generally it's 75% owner occupied and 25% rental. And so what we did was let's well let's actually look at the single family zones. And what we found is that within our single family zones, we are more or less at about 25%, uh, even lower in many of our neighborhoods. 25% of the parcels are for rental. So we're actually doing good. Is my point. Um, our neighborhoods are in. Um, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at it from an R1 perspective, we are in line with what's typical of a uh, normal city that doesn't have a large transient group of college students. So when you say 75% of, of Athens is, is rental property, you know, 800 of those units are some yeah. of the run. You know, so those, right. those, those large complexes kind of skew that when we talk about the percentage of our overall housing stock that's rental, but in the R1 zones mm -hmm. specifically, we're, we're, we're about on average or even better yeah, there's than about, a, lot of, a lot of communities. Sorry, didn't mean to cut no, you No, I'm sorry. Uh, about half of all the rental permits in Athens are sitting on 10 parcels. Yeah. Those are large parcels, of course. Don't, don't get... Um, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that statistic ends up getting thrown around a lot, but mm -hmm. it, it really kind of doesn't doesn't really apply. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. So once again, just for our audience, um, where the administration is basically proposing is that the R1s are protected from short-term rentals, uh, with the exceptions of Carpenter Street, Lancaster Street, Columbus Road, East State Street, and homes that abut an R2, R3, or a B zone. Is that correct? I got that? Right, for non-owner occupied. Right. I mean. um, there's only a few people in our audience, and uh, if they wish to come forward for three minutes and speak specifically to this proposal and not to anything else that's philosophical or, or what have you, just speaking specifically to this proposal. Um, they can come forward, state their name and address. Do you have the language changes that you uh, propose, please? <laughs> because I didn't see the document, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so, so what you're saying that if um, um, in uh, Title 23 under R1, uh, below number 
five that 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 uh, accessory uses that says long term. We're talking about long term rentals, and you're adding six that is then allowing short term rentals for two uh, resident renters. Uh, not more than two resident renters. So basically, you live in a house and you have a spare bedroom, you want somebody to live there, or you want somebody to, to, to rent out your spare bedroom, you would be allowed. So, so then R1 neighborhoods are not protected from short-term rentals, correct? I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, perhaps protected is a, is a strong phase. I, I, would I mean, say it was said, and that's why I'm asking. Sure, right? uh, you know, protected is probably, we, we basically further restricted the proposal from the last time, which was use the existing rental permit system and apply it to short-term rentals everywhere, and now say that uh, the existing rental permit pro uh, uh, program would be applied, but you couldn't do short-term rentals with non-owner-occupied residences in our one neighborhood. Okay, so the keeping of not more than two renters by a resident owner for a period of less than 30 days. Oh, housekeeping units may not keep short-term. Uh, so, so you are not, uh, uh, you are indeed allowing then short-term rentals in R1 neighborhoods, correct? In this proposal, if in this you live proposal. there, you could rent out a spare room in this manner and then be regulated. If, you're, if you met the housing code requirement for that. Now the challenge is doing, is meeting. No, no, that's just, that's for the non occupied Now I was seeing your short term rentals addition as being linked to the short term rentals in two on as far as uh, what you can do. As far as that, I didn't see it as being open-ended to R1 it's not. It, as a whole, right? So it is open-ended, correct? No. no. Correct? No. No. Okay, but... That's going to make, a, I, as I see it, that's going to make a reference to the uh, streets and the abutment that would be permissible. Okay, but if, if I, I permitted accessory uses, okay, they are permitted and specifically states, I mean, you all read it, so under short term rentals, um, but then section C is conditionally permitted, which is a totally different territory. Because that's for non resident owners. Correct. But for resident owners, short-term rentals are still, you're including that in the R1. Correct, under the rental permit structure. So you'd have to meet the requirements associated with the rental permit. Only with the rental permit? Mm -hmm. So, so you are, you, so R1 neighborhoods under what you're proposing are not protected for short-term rentals. I mean, because that was the whole conversation about having short-term rentals in the R1 neighborhoods in that you would have a flow of individuals uh, moving through however many housing short-term rental situations you have. I mean, and, and so you're saying that is then allowable under your proposal short-term rentals in an R1. I mean, the conditional is something totally different. Right. If you live there. It's for owner Well, occupied. right, right. Yes, but so that, correct. So you're not protecting R1 residential areas and their residents from short-term rentals. And then going to conditionally, and I guess I had a question under the conditional, conditionally permitted uses uh, on R1 lots, R1 lots that abut an R2 
or an R3 or any B, because on Mound Street we have several through lots from Lancaster, and those lots, those houses, which are now mostly rentals uh, along that block of Lancaster between 2nd and um, um, say, let's just say 2nd and Arc, which is where the through lots are, those houses on Lancaster, because they then are abutting an R2. That is, may, may I interject? Sure, go ahead. Sure, that was not the intent, was to, um, it, that sentence needs to have a separation there, or, or a semicolon or something. Um, what that was, um, so if you, allowing it on Lancaster, um, if, a, if you've got a through lot that on Mound Street, um, that would not be, um, you would not be able to do that is my point. Uh, on Mound Street, right, but you would do it on Lancaster. It's, yeah, so on Lancaster you'd be, you would be permitted to, to have it based on this language, con or conditionally permitted, excuse me. But right, then, and that would be in my front yard because it's a through lot and that house is sitting right up there. I mean, that's all I'm saying. Yes, it's like, I'm, okay, it's, yes, we're, we're on the same page, but I believe yes. that that language needs tightened up, yes. But the next the next lot over, because it abuts the lot that fronts on Lancaster would not be correct. That is correct, that yes. was made yeah, clear. Right. That, made, yeah. that was made okay. clear. Um, I know where it just needs to be tightened up. And, and so, um, who, who would be notified then if it went to the BZA? That that would be very peculiar. Uh, um, say the house is on Lancaster, and it's two lots down from me because I think there's four or five lots that are through lots there. If it was two lots down from me, then I would not even be notified that that house on Lancaster would be a short-term rental that does not have to be owner-occupied. And that was one of the big problems. So you're gonna have that situation, and I would not be notified, it would be two lots down from me, because I would not abut that property even in the rear, which is how they notify under the BCA, right? And so there, there could be two of these I mean, there's there's a couple of empty houses up there, and they have not been able to be rented. So somebody could start doing short-term rentals, non-resident owner, and that would be um, a situation that could get out of control um, right across the street from me, which is difficult for me. So I I think plus I agree with Nancy. The BZA approves everything these days. So. Everywhere and everything? Is that what no, you... No, I mean, I said it's consistently that way across the country. Right, and, and, and that's not, not the intent of a BCA, so I think Nancy and I understand that. But, and so this, this could be really troubling for me because then right across the street from me, I walk up the sidewalk into my car, and if on weekends, this, what could be, a very nice situation could turn into a very bad situation for me. I'd like to go ahead and move along okay. to somebody else. Thank you. Can I keep this? Hi, I'm Jan Hodson, 45 Graham Drive. Um, I'd like some clarification about number six, and I just, I had to write it down because I don't have my own copy here, but it seems to me that what it's saying, and please tell me if I'm interpreting this incorrectly. Thank you. <laughs> it will essentially allow two people to rent a house for a short term in an R1 neighborhood without the owner being there or living there. Yeah. It says resident owner, but what does that mean? Does that mean that there is an owner of that residence who's renting it out and living there so that they could leave town, be gone for six months in Florida, 
and rent consistently over and over again on weekends to two people in an R1. And if that's the case, we're sort of right back where we started from. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, when I think about resident owners, um, when people get rental permits now, um, as a resident owner for like having a room, a roomer, basically, they live there, right? Right. And they're, they're not, they're not leaving. They're not, they're, they're physically in the place. It would not be, I think it would be categorized as a, as a non-resident owner if you, you know, left town for six months to go to Florida, four months or one month to go somewhere and then turn it over to somebody. Um, that would be a non-resident owner and then the zoning would kick in. I, that's how we would interpret it anyway. That would not be the intent of this. The intent of this change was to make it stricter based on the feedback we were getting to where, you know, uh, you know, short of, you know, renting out the spare bedroom that you have, um, um, that you'd be, still be allowed to do that, but it would not be a situation where you could go and say, say, um, um, I'm, I'm going to go to Florida for six months and rent out my house and that count as a resident owner. I, that, that was not our intent, certainly, by writing this. Okay, so um, you want the owner to be there at the time, but yet how can that be insured? And you're still, basically, you're still bringing people into an R1 neighborhood who are renting short term. So the only real safeguard you're sort of giving us is, the, is that you're expecting that owner to be there on the property all the time. Is that what we're supposed to have? You know, I, I guess, I mean, to the to the commission uh, here, you know, we did everything we could to make this as restrictive as possible without completely um, just outlawing it. You know, because there's a there's a certain amount of uh, people that came before this this body that said, hey, um, we, uh, we 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 want to do this, and so we're trying to give a common sense uh, response back that that allows it to, to have a real strict regulation. My fear, uh, to be perfectly honest, is that the state of Ohio is going to pass legislation that says, sorry, towns, you can't you can't ban these, mm -hmm. and we will have banned something, and then then we're. Up, up a creek. Whereas with this, we've heavily regulated it and we have a mechanism by which to go and say, okay, Athens didn't ban it. Athens just regulated it. And so long as people are falling in line with the regulations, we'll be able to stay compliant with state law when the state preempts us. So that was kind of my intent here. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was our shot. Here's so. my feeling about that. Um, you're not banning it. You're allowing it in certain neighborhoods. All Under fine and good. Very strict so, conditions. Pardon me? Under very strict conditions. Exactly. Right, right. I, I'm agreeing with that. Right. You're not, so you're not issuing a total ban. I'm totally understandable. In the R1, you're still opening the door to it. And I just have this feeling that part of it is what, I've, what I keep hearing, and I've heard this in the community, is that, well, people are doing it anyway. We may as well make it legal and, and, and enforce it. And then the enforcement part is fuzzy. Or, well, you know, there are certain people who are doing it already, to which I have to say, if you're living in an R1 and you started a business of short-term rentals, you either looked at the law and you decided it didn't apply to you or you were going to flaunt it, or you didn't look at all at the law and see that you weren't supposed to do it. So now, those of us who've been living in the R1 are being told, you kind of have to swallow this now because some people did it already and we don't want to get them mad and get them all upset. But I would say they were breaking the law from the beginning. It's never been legal in an R1, but they've been permitted. And to just open it now, I, I just feel as if maybe the wording, if that's what you're intending, isn't really tightening it up to the point where we're not right back to having um, an owner owned house, but they're not there and they're renting it out. That's Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comment? Sure. Hi, I'm Diane McVeigh. I live at 83 Grosvenor Street. I have been doing Airbnb out of my house for a number of years because it's not illegal in Athens to do it. 
I think we have the same goals, and that is to increase home ownership in R1 zones in this city. And I think that by allowing a homeowner who lives there to host people, you're accomplishing several positive things. The, the main thing I see is it allows someone to stay in their home or it allows a young couple to buy a home if they can make a little extra money to pay their insurance, to pay their property taxes. They are going to be there as a host. They are going to present Athens as a positive, progressive place and they are going to tell those people about all the little places they can go to eat, the things they can find. I think Athens is very progressive. There is no way that you want to have a reputation of banning the sharing economy because millennials, that's what they're into, that's what it's going to be. Athens is progressive and we cannot have a reputation of no uh, having none of these things in our in our neighborhoods of banning it so that is just not going to be possible it's not illegal now but what the city has been trying to do is put in very strict regulations so that we do control it so that we do not have the problems other places have had with party houses and all of that in our neighborhoods and so I think that it's very important that we you know, look at this, and it is important to have the details of how it's, it's laid out. But I do think that it can actually increase home ownership in our R1 neighborhoods. It can actually have places, people have a little extra money to clean them up. Just what you're saying, no one's going to go and stay in a place that doesn't look nice. So people are going to have to increase uh, or improve their properties. And uh, I just feel it is a very positive thing, but I feel very strongly that we do want this regulation, and I think homer, home owner occupied is the key thing. It won't work for everybody. I think you, maybe there are long-term renters that it might work for, but if you start with homeowner occupied that want to act as host, that's the, one of the key things to this, and I think that's exactly what you've been trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, nothing else? Yes. And it's specifically to this proposal. Yes. My name is Betty Hollow. I live at 31 Maplewood Drive in Athens. And I have to say that I'm simply confused. So, if we have in Section 5 something that says that if you live in a house, you can rent short term to two people. Then we get to six, and it says, if you live in a house, you can rent short term to two people if you get a conditional use permit. Am, uh, am I confused? Yeah. I seem to be. Okay, please explain one more time what's the difference. I understand. <laughs> the conditional use permit is specific to uh, for non-resident owners and short-term rentals and okay. specific so we do to have non-resident owners that we're talking about. Okay. On the lots that are bid to about to R2, R3, and any B zone okay. or So the there are restrictions. And then I guess my next concern is how do you get that conditional use permit? And I know that that depends very much on the members if it comes to zoning, depends on the zoning board members and their own experiences and prejudices and thoughts at the moment and it also depends obviously on the zoning code and whoever's giving these permissions so if that just becomes so frequent that it's just sort of automatic then I think you've got a problem and I guess I'm concerned about what will the parking restriction restrictions be what will the lot size be what will keep me from butting right into the face of the visitors okay and maybe you don't have an answer for me at the moment or maybe you do 
I could probably talk to lot size on the bulk controls if we pull right. lot size out um, specifically. And then the other question was on parking. Yeah, all the lots in my area are 50 by 100, so the houses are very close together. Most of the parking is in driveways, which are relatively short. Some of the driveways are shared. So will this be on-street parking, driveway parking, extra parking that really exists? What what? What can I, if, if this goes through to the city council, they love it, and it's all done, then how can I be sure that things are really executed in the way that you hope and intend that they should be? I understand. If you were to get a rental permit um, right now for a resident owner, for a renter, and you were doing it in a situation uh, where you previously didn't rent before, uh, and you were getting uh, inspected for that permit and they were looking at the ball controls and parking, how would that, how would that work? Like say for instance a 31, 31 Briarwood. And I, it could be towards, towards uh, Lance or towards David. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the current parking restrictions for a resident owner would be you have to have a minimum of two spots for the homeowner and then you'd have to have one additional for each person. Okay. So if you rented one room, you'd have to have a minimum of three spots. Okay. If you had two rooms, you'd have to have a minimum of four. Okay, and th they could be stacked in the driveway? And in R1, yes, you can be stacked. Okay. And if the resident were not present, then what? So in the circumstances like, uh, uh, we'll go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So if it's just a regular, let's just say a regular rental, no, not owner occupied, you still have to have a minimum of two, right. which would give you enough for two unrelated people or a family. If right. you wanted the third one, you would have to have a third spot. Okay, got it. There was something else I wanted to ask you, but it's gone out of my head, so thank you very much. Um, Lance, the applicant application process would someone from your department go out and look at a site before making a final approval? Yes, we would go out and check the parking and verify however, they'll have a spot to put on there, how many they think they have, and then we actually go out and officially measure if they actually have that amount or not. So you could even possibly say that you really don't measure up to the applicant requirements? Correct. Mm -hmm. And then deny that application? And then deny it, then we would refuse it. And you do that at the same time that you do the inspection for the, the housing inspection internally? We, we would go out and check the parking before we would do the inspection because it doesn't make sense for us to, okay. to do the inspection if it doesn't meet the parking. If it doesn't meet the zoning, the right. controls on zoning, right. they can't even, they, they couldn't get the permit anyway, so there's no reason to even do an internal inspection. Correct. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, well, let's see. Mr. Stauffer, and then we're going to... It's three minutes. Jack Stoffer, 69 Elmwood. Um, I would also like to get a copy of that uh, new document. I don't need it right at this second, but I would like one to take home so I could study it. Um, I want to make sure I understood what I think I heard, and that is, as far as R1 goes, the bed and breakfast or short-term rentals, however you refer to them, will be permitted on the main thoroughfares, but not and facing the main thoroughfares, but not allowed to come down in to the neighborhoods. Is, is that what I'm understanding? Correct. Um, East State Street, Carbon Street, Langa Street, and Columbus Road. That's spelled out on that document? Yes. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, so I want to say thank you very, very, very much for that. Um, concession or uh, decision that you've made in regards to that. I don't really understand all these other things exactly as far as uh, what uh, Ms. Kaczynski and, and Ms. Hollow were talking about, but where you are going to, I think, allow some in R1, owner occupied and present. If that wording was in there, would that appease the folks that just brought up those two points would be my question, which seems like 
could be logical and or a good idea. But again, it comes back to uh, how the heck you going to enforce it. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jane, you had one last question, and then we're going to close the uh, discussion from the audience. Uh, yes, I'm oh, sorry. Joan Kurnansky, 56 Mile Street. Under the short-term rental, and they get then a short-term rental permit, correct? Correct. Because they then they would have to pay the guest tax, et cetera, et cetera. So does that make them a business? And if so, how does that interact with uh, the regulations for having a business in an R1 zone? You know, that's, that's something we've thought a lot about because if you think about it, a long-term rental, is that not a business as well? Since somebody is making money, receiving whether it's your mortgage payment or mortgage payment plus, are, is that a, a business in an R1 that exists now? Well, except that they're, because they're paying the guest tax and that puts them into categories of um, transient uh, guest tax for hotels, motels, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and I'm fortunate I didn't bring my, all my guidelines with me, so, and I only vaguely remember some of those regulations, but, but that was one of my questions. How, and then how do people that have businesses then look at this and say, well, then, I'm, I'm not sure that's a conflict, but I think it could be a conflict. I understand your question, but again, I would contend that a long-term rental, if, if the thinking becomes that this is a business or, a, you know, a small business of some type, so would a long-term rental be a business as well. Yeah, but it's already allowed. This is something that's being added, so this is making a change to the code. Um, a short-term rental, and I, I think most people would agree that a short-term rental, even though we're not using bed and breakfast, I was looking back here, and et cetera, et cetera, um, that, that that is the type of business that is occurring here. It's just, you know, I, I, I don't think it's clear enough to make uh, short-term rentals a dwelling unit offered for rent in part, and then we it was scratched out. These can be homestays, bed and breakfast, or tourist homes. And Ohio Revised, Co Revised Code does allow for bed and breakfast. So um, I, I, I don't know why we're not using that term then, uh, because it, it would clarify it, and, as opposed to shooting it out. So uh, I'll Thank go. You. I just. Well, the only thing I, I was just thinking in terms of like number six is just a way to insert that the owner had to be on premises at the time of the rental? Or is that a doable thing? I think that's, to me, the, the biggest concern right. that I'm hearing. We, um, I don't have an answer for you on that, but we, we've, we, we've discussed that. People have mentioned that more than once. And uh, you know, then it's a question of how do you define being present? Um, am I allowed to go to work if I'm running it out? Like legitimate, can I, like, how, how do we define that and how do we track it at that point? Yeah, I and, think. And that is a, yeah, so the I think tracking it's like it a is reasonable, a real issue. Right. I think you can come to a reasonable conclusion. That that kind of stuff is allowable if you're talking about someone who's going out of town right. and, and renting. That, that would be, I think, the issue that I would have on that. I okay. mean, if someone has to go to work, uh, if someone does something of that nature, that's one mm -hmm. thing, get a haircut. But you know. So to to, the, to your point, do you think within that um, suggested number six, do you think there's a like worded wording we should be discussing that would address that? I'm just asking. You know, yeah. You're you're much more professional at this than I am. You know, expert. But uh, you know, is there a way that we can insert where people don't go to Florida? And right, then, that, right. That the owner yeah, has to yeah. has to reasonably yeah. be on pre on on uh, premises. So it could be. I mean, I'm, I'm go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, Nancy. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to suggest that a property manager could mm. fill that function. It may not be acceptable, mm -hmm. but when I rent a house next door to me, I 
went to see my grandchildren at Christmas. I gave, you know, I have told them they have the number if something happens, if the water line breaks. Mm -hmm. But of course, I'm renting to adults. Yeah, I, I would just want to assist or uh, sense that if something happened at the house, they could do that, and yeah. the owner was away, you know, Someone else is then who who is responsible when the police or the fire department come and try to resolve some issue? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just the people. Mm -hmm just the renters right that's the only thing I'm trying to I got gotcha. you yeah. noise complaint that sort of yeah I, yeah, understand. I mean I think you're on a very good course here yeah. I, I really don't want to diminish that at all is there something that we can just buttress that a little bit more mm -hmm. you know I know there's a mechanism in a <clears throat> rental permit process for we have that uh, we require a 24-hour emergency contact number mm -hmm. for any permit so this will be included as part of that okay we have to do that currently with rental permits for, I mean, that's for all, all, all and this, this would be included in that. Yeah. And this is an owner occupied. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for since it's under the permit system. Hmm. I have one question. Are these huh? going to be counted as rentals now? Are you going to make people, homeowners count their houses as rentals? So it looks like we have less residents. Oh, no. You know, back to the mayor's question of, of the planner regarding it, but you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, if I could speak to this. Sure. Um, you know, I guess it would be both. You know, really, um, you know, how you statistically defined it uh, when you have a situation like that, I think it, there, would, there would be a rental permit for sure um, applied to it because that's the, me that's the regulatory mechanism. But, Correct. Um, you know, I would contend if it was, a, if it was an owner-occupied situation, that would be a home owned by somebody. That wouldn't be a... Yeah. yeah, the categorization of homeowner versus 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 rental property. I think it would be. I mean, it really would be both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, does someone want to put forth a motion? I would move that we uh, um, we make this recommendation in accordance with this language, uh, with a modification that we spoke to earlier, um, with the correction of number two to number three. Uh, that was the typo correction under the conditional uses and additional the language of the principal home front on East State Street, Carpenter Street, Lancaster Street, or Columbus Road. But otherwise, as, as put forward. Is there a second? I'll second that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 So that's unanimous with one abstention. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on. Let's see. Um, reports from uh, our departments, Mr. Logue. Well, Happy New Year. Start with that, and I will keep it brief since we've been here a while. Uh, we I fully anticipate that the <clears throat> draft comprehensive plan will be ready within the next two weeks. Uh, once we have that uh, uh, out there for public distribution, we will then uh, very early in February, and most likely, be asking the uh, Planning Commission and City Council for support to move forward with it and uh, assuming that, that um, there is support to move forward with it. Um, uh, my first goal as far as implementation of our plan will be to do a um, uh, large scale audit of all of our city codes to try to bring them into conformance with our development goals and our uh, planning goals. So that would include subdivision regulations, zoning code, landscaping regulations, floodplain, all of that to try to really look at our look at the city as a whole and figure out, you know, can we actually achieve what we want to achieve based upon the rules that we have in place? And if not, what rules do we need to be uh, addressing? That is all. Thank you. Happy New Year. Any comments for Mr. Lowe? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Riggs? Let me echo Paul's Happy New Year. Um, and I don't have any uh, new business coming up for the council. Planning Commission, sorry. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Mr. Riggs? Thank you. Um, opportunity for uh, anyone to speak uh, in our live audience uh, on items that were not covered on today's agenda. Uh, our announcements and other business. Mayor, anything? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, let's see. And uh, our next meeting will be January 16, 2020. And uh, with the business of the Athens City Planning Commission uh, completed. This meeting stands adjourned. Okay.